today is our Vision Sunday. And what that means is we're going to take a little bit of time just to look at what we sense God might be speaking to us in this next season in our life as a church. And uh, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture. We're looking at Matthew's Gospel, just a few verses uh, today. And it's Matthew chapter 9. Oh, I should have said, the youth are going to go down. It's not that they don't like my speaking. Uh, it's just that they have a, a more exciting group down in the crypt. So uh, thanks, Marcus. Sorry I didn't say that. Uh, we are looking at Matthew chapter 9 and verses 35 to 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Today is our Vision Sunday. It's an exciting day for us. And I want us to consider the question, could I be the answer to somebody's prayer? Recently, we've been advertising for a few different staff roles on our team here at the church. And we've been praying, Lord, send help. Send help. And every time someone has applied and they've got that job, we've introduced them at our Tuesday morning staff meeting. And we've said, you are so welcome. And you are an answer to our prayers. The truth is, in many different ways, we are all an answer to somebody's prayer. In this passage, Jesus doesn't say, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, so panic. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, so pray, ask, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. And as I've reflected on this passage uh, this week, it struck me that we all have the potential to be the answer to that prayer of the disciples. They prayed to send out workers into his harvest field. The disciples became the answer to their own prayer. And like them, Jesus is calling each one of us out as workers in his harvest field, co-laborers, Metaphorically speaking, sowing and planting and reaping for the kingdom of God. If you've been here over the last few weeks, you'll know that uh, we've been celebrating. We've been taking time to look back with thanks on the 150 years of this church. Little cornerstone over there, you might be able to see this place built in 1873. This church alive and active in this city and in this community Serving people, seeing lives transformed, proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Continuing the ministry that Jesus started in this passage that we read. And the disciples continued on. We've taken time to look back on our story so far. All the stuff that God has been doing in the life of this church. You, this church, this beacon of light here in this part of the city. Helping people giving hope to people. But now is the time to look forward with hope. What does God want to do with us as a church for the next 150 years? I wonder what you'll be doing in 150 years' time. Uh, hopefully, like me, you'll be worshipping with the angels. But 150 years starts with a one. One day one week, one year. God is calling us to be a part of this long obedience in the same direction. For however long God might call you here to be part of this church in this part of the city. And in a relay race, the baton is handed on to the next person to run that leg of the race. And the baton is now firmly in our hands and as we've experienced as a church, what, 
we do now will influence the people who come and worship in this place in the future. I was struck by some of the words in that video that really impacted me. Years of prayer and gentle persuasion. This church, a catalyst for church planting. So many churches that have been planted now all across this country as part of this HTB network. This was the second church plant. This was a catalyst for those churches being planted. What Sandy said there, it needed a lot of work to uh, it needed a lot of work done to it. There's no question about that, and that needs money and a vision. We're worshiping here today because people before us were the answer to somebody's prayer. Those prayers that were prayed when this church was envisioned and built. How could we now be the answer to someone's prayer? Maybe a prayer for help, for hope, as we move on into the future. Our vision here is to see faith rise, the church rise, and the city rise. And we exist really to help people discover a relationship with Jesus. To go deeper in their faith with Jesus. To be equipped as distinctively Christian leaders to resource and plant churches. And also to play our part in the transformation of our city. And this is a vision that certainly can't be done by Emily and I or the staff team. It involves all of us, everybody playing their part. It's not about maintenance, but it's about multiplication to see this church grow spiritually and numerically, to see the spiritual temperature of our city rise, to see this place grow in love for Jesus these verses that we read out in Matthew's Gospel, those few verses just form a bridge between the ministry of Jesus that we see him doing in chapters 5 to 9. We find him preaching the good news of the kingdom. He's healing the sick. He's performing miracles. And then the extension of that ministry to his disciples, where in chapter 10 he sends out the 12, and he gives them authority to do the same, to do the things that he's been doing. And here in the Gospels, it's like that baton handing over moment. He invites his disciples to play their part in what he has been doing, to get involved in the race and to start running. I find it interesting as I read this passage that the need was too great even for Jesus to meet alone. It says that he looked at the crowds and they were harassed and helpless. I definitely have days when I feel harassed and helpless. But it's true, isn't it? So many people in our society are harassed and helpless, full of anxiety, lacking hope, full of worry, confused, searching for meaning and purpose in their lives searching for love in their lives. And life is tough, and Jesus knows that. So here he calls on some of his closest followers and friends to get involved, to meet the need. And he urges them here in this passage to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out workers into the mission field. Very simply, this passage highlights Jesus' mission and our mission that we now have to bring salvation and his call for his followers to join in that work. That is what this vision is all about. So how do we get involved? How do we respond? How could we be the answer to somebody's prayer? The first thing is, is to have the heart of Jesus. Have the heart of Jesus. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. The ancient Greek word, splangnizomai, a very familiar word to lots of you, I'm sure, as it was to me. It actually means literally to feel in your guts. It's like this deep, visceral pain. And this is what's translated here as the word compassion from the Latin, com, with, 
and passio, to suffer. Compassion literally means suffering with. Isn't that what Jesus has done for us? He suffered for us. Emily and I, and I know some of you have been joining with us recently, we've been praying for a young boy who's uh, in recent weeks been really struggling with a really rare form of bone cancer. And every time I've been thinking about this little boy, 11 years old, in his hospital bed, think about him and his family, just something inside of me kind of aches. It's like that, oh, this poor boy, like, God, you've got to do something. My heart breaks. And I know that for many of us in different situations and circumstances, we've known what that deep gut, visceral feeling is like when we're moved on the inside. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. The message version of the Bible puts it like this. When he looked over the crowds, his heart broke. What is it that breaks your heart? When you look over the crowds, your community, this city, maybe your street, maybe your family, maybe this church, what is it that breaks your heart? I need more of the heart of Jesus. I need him to break my heart again with the things that break his heart. I need his compassion to compel me into action. Seeing a need in our society and trying to solve it will only go so far. But when something breaks our hearts, when we get a deep passion inside of us, prompted by the Holy Spirit, that's the calling that makes all the difference. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says, If I give all I possess to the poor, but have not love, I gain nothing. It starts in the heart. So that's the first thing. We need to have the heart of Jesus. Second, be the hands and feet of Jesus. Then Jesus says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There's work to be done. There's things that we can get involved in. And when we have the heart of Jesus, we can't help but be moved to serve like Jesus to become his hands and feet. That's what the church is. We are the embodiment, the physical embodiment of Jesus Christ. And he has given us gifts and skills and talents and even the gift of time to serve where he's placed us. I know many of you are doing this in so many ways. And I want to say a huge thank you. So many are serving, being the hands and feet of Jesus. But what does that look like for us, again, to think, God, how, how, how do you want me to be your hands and your feet today? Maybe it's inviting people, just simply asking people to come and see on a Sunday to Alpha, maybe to the LZ7 event tomorrow night. What God might do just through that invitation. I heard about one lady who wasn't a Christian, but she prayed, God, if you're really real, I want to ask you to get someone to invite me to church at work today. And she was working somewhere for a very long time, and that never happened. And she kept praying that prayer. And it took her going to work at Lambeth Palace <laughs> with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And thankfully, somebody at Lambeth Palace invited her to come to church. How could we be the answer to somebody's prayer? Maybe it's through welcoming we have some amazing world-class welcomers here at this church, particularly in this service. But actually, welcome's not just on the door giving a hello. Welcome's so much more than that. I love hearing about Angie Payne, who's here today. She comes and serves midweek. She sits on the reception. And uh, she doesn't only give a welcome to all of the spear trainees that are coming in, our food bank guests that are coming in, but also our delivery drivers uh, everybody who comes into this building, she gives that sense of kindness and welcome. I think about Ian and Susan who sometimes come and they tend the gardens around this church. 
Everything speaks. The message doesn't just happen when someone stands up here and gives the message. This building, this facility, these gardens, they're giving a message to every person who drives past up Battersea Rise, down Boutflower Road. What this building looks like, that's why our, our media and our, our comms, that's why it's so strategic and so important for us reaching out with the kindness and the love of God to a digital generation. Being the hands and feet of Jesus by serving those in our own community, with our kids and our youth, our young people. If it takes a village to raise a child, it's going to take more than just a few willing volunteers to raise a hundred children in our children's work. And believe me, when I see the crowds of children coming to this service, sometimes our core leaders look a little harassed and helpless. And what does that look like for us to have compassion for our kids? Not to see them as the church of the future, but the church of today. These are the ones who need discipleship. These are the ones who need investment. Could you be an answer to that prayer today? Maybe it's by leading groups or hosting or providing hospitality in some way. Maybe by serving some of the most vulnerable and marginalized in our community through our transformation ministries. Uh, it's been exciting to see so many opportunities opening up. The, the women's drop-in that started uh, helping those who've been suffering with um, domestic abuse and violence, the one-stop shop that happens here on a Monday, and of course through Spear and our food bank. I heard that one, per one person texted one of our food bank team uh, just last week. This was what they said, OMG, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. I can eat now, which means I'm more able to work without passing out or becoming ill. I can also now get to work on the bus and we'll be able to walk back. So much I can do easier now. All based around eating enough or not enough is a massive difference to me. What you're doing makes such a difference in the lives of the people in this area. But the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And maybe you're here today and you think, that's great for someone else. Or I'm pretty maxed out at the moment. Or maybe you're just thinking, I, I don't really know where to start. If you're wondering about where you might think about serving, being the hands and feet of Jesus, may I encourage you again. There's a few things listed on this card. Check it out. Uh, after this service, we've got some of our team leaders who are going to be here, just really available to have a conversation. It may be that you don't want to get involved every week. Or maybe you can't do any of these things, but perhaps you do have something that you can give. And we would love to have a conversation with you. There's also a QR code that you can click on if that's your preference. And you can go through to our website. There's lots of information there. So we're sent out into the harvest field with the heart of Jesus. To be the hands and feet of Jesus. And finally, through knowing the hope of Jesus. I'm struck that they went out proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. We have good news of great hope. The local church is the hope of the world. Not because of us, but because of Jesus. And it's the hope of Jesus that enables us to keep going with this work. Paul says in Galatians 6... 9 to 10, and I want us to be encouraged by these words. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. On this Vision Sunday, as we come to share communion together in just a moment. Let us look back with thanks and remember the cross. It's the cross of Jesus Christ through which we have eternal hope. And without the hope of the cross and the resurrection fueling this vision, to be quite honest, we're just another social gathering. 
We're just another service in our community. But it's the cross of Christ. It's the hope of Jesus, which means that what we do has eternal significance. He is the Lord of the harvest. And one day, Jesus says, he will draw all people to himself. That's what we are evidence of today. We are part of this miracle of people being the answer to the prayer of those disciples, that the Lord of the harvest might send out workers into his harvest field. That's what we can be a part of, so that we might see faith rise and the church rise and the city rise in this part of London. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't we pray and... uh, just before we receive communion. Father, we thank you that you are alive. Thank you that we can have hope in you. And I pray, God, that you would give us your heart. Show us where we can be your hands and your feet. And may again today we know the hope through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Amen.